All right. Good afternoon, everybody. Afternoon. That was a little weak. <laughs> <laughs> Let's try that again. Good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Oh, good, because I'm happy to see you. You all look so good. I'm so glad to be here. Yeah, we're going to talk about restorative justice. And this is going to be a little interesting because I had told you already, I think, that we're going to talk about Peter today. We're not talking about Peter today. So <laughs> God had other things to tell you today. So we're going to talk about what God gave me. And I pray that uh, he's got my back. I know he does. We want to talk about restorative justice up close. Up close. Because unless we see restorative justice playing out in our own lives, unless we see it up close, it's going to be very hard for us to fight for in other places. Mm. It's going to be very hard for us to stand up for it in other places. It's going to be very hard for, be, for us to be believable in our convictions about it unless we see it up close. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Hope that works for you. Amen? Right. Here's what happens, right? When Now, Mako really broke down restorative justice and why that is... Um, what we believe the biblical approach to justice. He talked about four different types of justice last week. And if you missed it, catch the YouTube. All right, praise God for YouTube and technology, right? Um, and he really broke that down. And we're going to take a little bit of a parallel path, and then we're going to get back to sort of how do we affect change in our society and how we pay attention to what's going on around us. Amen? So when we think restorative justice, we oftentimes think about things like this. And that is right and good. We should think about big things that affect people, right? Mass incarceration, mandatory minimums, education policy, welfare reform. All of these are areas where we could use a little more restorative justice. Amen? A little less retributive justice. Right? And we think about these things and then we go and we talk about that. But here's what I want to ask you. Restorative justice sounds good on the policy level, but what about when we apply it to our lives and it gets a little more uncomfortable? What about when you're the one who's been hurt? Do you want the best that God has? For the people that do you harm. Mm. Uh, it's got all quiet in the church. <laughs> Why? Because we don't like talking about that. Right? When it's other people, yes, Lord, restore them. Take them to the throne of Jesus. <laughs> but let someone cut you off when you're driving or step on your foot or knock over your juice in the dining hall. Then you want to cut somebody. Not you. Of course, you're very nice, but that's... <laughs> <laughs> Am I right? I mean, like, let somebody do something fairly insignificant to you and to me. And as a man, this guy, there should be a trial. There should be a jury. That, you know, we just want to throw them under the jail. At least that's me, you know. We're from Jersey, Ezzy and I. We're, we're from Jersey, so that's kind of part of being from Jersey, you know. My first word was revenge, you know, so. <laughs> that's just how it is. Just how it is coming from where we're coming from. So this whole thing is, is messing up my life, too. You know, God is messing us all up right now. Just don't think I got this all figured out, right? But, but. That's what God was talking to me. He's like, son, if you're going to really talk about restorative justice, then, then you've got to be clear on what you're talking about, son. Do you really want it? I hate when he talks to me like that. It gets all real. There's a story I want to bring to our attention. It's found in John chapter 8. And we're going to read verses 3 through 11. John chapter 8. Verses 3 through 11. The teachers of the law and the Pharisees brought in a woman caught in adultery. They made her stand before the group and said to Jesus, Teacher, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. 
In the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women. What do you say? And John clues us in. They were using this question as a trap in order to have a basis for accusing him. But Jesus bent down and started to write on the ground with his finger. So here's the trap. So under the law of Moses, it said that if you catch a couple of people in adultery, you are to stone them both, actually, not just the woman, which is interesting. Where's the dude in this? We don't know. We can only speculate why the man wasn't brought before Jesus either. But I suspect something fishy is going on, right? Something fishy is going on. I mean, folks that commit adultery usually don't do it in such a way that they could be discovered by others. I don't know what's happening here, but something smells rotten. You follow what I'm saying? So they commit adultery. They bring the man, not the woman, because under Jewish law, she's supposed to be stoned. But under Roman rule, they forbade the Jews from carrying out any capital justice and putting anyone to death by law. That comes into play into, in Jesus' trial. Yes? Okay. So under Roman rule, they can't execute anyone. But under Jewish law, it says that he should. So they're trying to jam him up. So if he goes and say, yeah, let's stone her, they accuse him of being a, a rebel and going against the Roman authority. If he sides with the Romans, oh, see, he's not a real Jew. Right? They're trying to jam Jesus up. So here's what Jesus does. He just kneels down and starts riding in the sand. And, and folks, I, no one knows. I wish I knew what he was riding <laughs> in the sand. I do. I tell you if I knew. We don't know what he was writing in the sand, but he was writing something, something real good, because here's what happens. Verse 7, when they kept on questioning him, he straightened up and said to them, let any of you who's without sin be the first to throw a stone at her. Again, he stooped down and wrote on the ground. At this, those who heard began to go away one at a time. The older ones first until Jesus, until only Jesus was left and the woman still standing there. Jesus straightened up and asked her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? No one, sir. She said, then neither do I condemn you. Jesus declared, go now and leave your life of sin. Amen. Now here's how we typically talk about this. We, we focus on how cool Jesus is in this. Because Jesus is really cool in this story. Right? I mean, he, he just starts bending down and writing stuff. And then, man, they're ready to kill her. And now they're not. Right? But let's talk about how uncool Jesus is in this story. Because she did it. Right? She did do it. And adultery back then, you know, people think it's harsh that people were sentenced to death for adultery back then. But don't you realize that more than it is now, the family was the foundation for all of their society. Right. And, and there were certain roles that they really needed women to play in their society for society to work. And so they frowned upon things that would break down the family and cause division in society. It's a lot more critical back then. If we were living under those conditions, we probably make similar decisions. So it's easy for us to judge from, a, from 2016 folks back then, but they're, they were living in a different reality. And to them, that made a lot of sense. Right? And so, and listen, I'm not, by me saying that, I'm not saying it's okay, <laughs> right? When we're not treated well, then I'm not excusing what they did, but to them, it made sense, right? So, but she did it. Family is harmed here. People are harmed by this situation. And then Jesus says, go now and leave your life of sin. Now I'm telling you somewhere, someone in this story is upset. Somewhere, someone in the story feels like that's it. That's all he's going to say. That's all that's going to happen. I'll tell you this. 
I don't know a lot about God. I, I know a bit, right? But what I know is that the longer I walk with God, the more times I find myself being a little bit uncomfortable with his goodness. I'm getting better because my mind is shifting, but there's sometimes in some situations where he's so good that I'm like, wow, God, do you really have to be that good? Do you really have to be that good? And if you don't ask that question, you probably have a, a wrong image of who God is. You know, you probably have an image of a harsh dude. Maybe, maybe you're thinking about Zeus. I'm not sure. <laughs> but if you follow the God that I serve, a couple of times, there's some stories that might... I wonder what's up with that. There is something about the nature of God's grace that seems so wonderful up to a point, but then you get to a point where you're saying... It can't be that good because if th that's good, then some people will get away with stuff. If it's that good, then some people might not get what they deserve. Now that might just be me. Am I in the right place? Am I? Is it just me that just thinks so terribly about people? And it's just you. It's just me. Thought so. <laughs> I'll just beat myself in the corner until I start to see things the right way. There, there's something about God's grace. And in this story, it's incredible. But at the same time, it's an example of a form of justice that might make us a little bit uncomfortable. Because there is no punishment doled out here. And if you read through all the scriptures, you find Jesus doesn't just do this a couple of times. He does this a lot. Where he doesn't give people what we think they deserve. Or what society thinks they deserve. He's far less judgmental than me and you. That's just a simple fact of the nature of God. He is far, even though he is the one truly fit to judge, and he has the authority... And he has the right to judge. He withholds judgment. And so we're, conf we're confronted with this story about this woman. We have to make sense of it. And the only way to make sense of it is to realize that God is looking at other things. There's a bigger story. There's a bigger narrative. There's something bigger that he's working on. Because he is a just God. But his finish line is different than ours. His finish line is different. See, what God is focused on is not making you feel bad about the stuff you did. Right? From, from the beginning, we were made in the image of Christ, who is the image of God. We were made in Christ. And from the beginning... What well, God's goal is, I said, I'm going to make them look like Jesus. That's what I'm going to do. I'm going to make me some people. I'm going to be in a relationship with them, and they're going to be like Jesus. And so what his justice is, is doing the things to bring us in line with who we were made to be. And sometimes that takes the form of him just saying, go now and leave your life of sin. Sometimes that's all he needs to do. And sometimes he has to say, you know what? I'm going to tear this temple down. There's not going to be one stone left because you have made this an idol. It's getting in the way of you getting to me and I'm going to tear it down. In fact, I'm going to tear this whole city down. You can't just put God into a box and say his justice always looks like X, Y, and Z because his goal is to conform us to the image of his son and he's the only one that really knows how to do that. 
Sometimes we see curveballs that don't make a lot of sense because he's the only one that sees all the way down the road to the end. I want to show you a video. I'm telling you, the first time I saw this video, I had to rewind it because I was like, I can't believe what I just watched what I watched. Um, have you ever heard of the movie Tip of the Spear? Um, it's old, maybe only me and you are the only ones old enough. Our generation. Our generation. It's a big movie. It's a big movie. It was about missionaries that went to a part of the world uh, where they were murdered uh, by the folks that they sought to bring to Christ. And it's a true story. And you're about to hear from the son of one of those people. His name is Stephen Saint. And he's going to tell you the story of what God did in his life after his father was murdered. Amen. So let's just take a look at this together. My dad was killed when I was just a little boy, and it was uh, with four of his friends, and it, it was a really violent um, killing. And people ask me all the time, you know, how I could forgive the people that killed my dad, including Grandfather Minkai, who I think was the one who finally did kill my dad. You know, I'm sure that they don't understand the perspective from which I saw it all. My dad and his four friends, Roger, Pete, Ed, and Jim, knew that they were risking their lives to try to contact this violent group that had never had friendly contact with the outside world. And then when it came right down to them being attacked, they had guns and they could have defended themselves, but they preferred to die rather than kill even in self-defense. My aunt was living with a young girl from the Waurani tribe who had fled. My mom went on praying for the Waurani, and then Aunt Rachel went back in to live with these people for the very first time as outsiders. And my, my aunt knew that there was a risk, and I knew that there was a risk that she would be killed too. Well, by the time a year, year and a half later, when I got to go in and live with Aunt Rachel with these people who had killed my dad, that isn't the way I saw them at all. I saw them as being the most special people in the whole world. I mean, why else would my dad have been willing to die for them, my mom go on praying for them, and my aunt risk her life for them? People think it's so amazing that I would forgive Minkai, but you know, in their culture, because he killed my family, it was my right and my responsibility when I grew up to kill him or his family. But when I went in to live in the jungles, I was just, oh, eight or nine. And I didn't have any of the skills that I needed to live in the jungles. And Minkai, I went to my Aunt Rachel and he, he said, what's wrong with, with Steve? They call me Baba down there. What's wrong with Baba? He doesn't know how to make poison for his darts, how to... He can't make darts, he doesn't know how to use a blowgun, he can't track animals. He said, he doesn't know anything. He said, who's going to teach him how to live? And my aunt said, you having speared his father, who do you say should teach him to live? And he came back and he said, me having speared his father, now I say I myself will teach him to live. But you know, in doing that, because he had started walking a new trail. He had no idea, I was just a little boy, he had no idea whether I was gonna walk God's trail or whether I would use the skills that he was teaching me to come back and kill him. But he forgave me what he assumed I would grow up to do because he had begun walking this new trail. So really, if you look at it in the reality in which it took place, the forgiveness that he was willing to believe that I had given up my vendetta against him and then gave me the skills that I would need to carry it out if I didn't give it up, his was maybe the greater forgiveness than mine. People have been able in this story to identify with my loss, but what they can't seem to identify with is how I and my family, how we experienced gain. You know, when my dad was killed and I was a little boy, I can still remember that sense of anguish, disenfranchisement. I mean, my whole little boy universe revolved around my dad. I wanted to grow up and be just like him. He was my hero. When my mom told me that he was never coming back, 
I mean, it shattered my whole world. I thought there was nothing left to live for. Do you know what? Just a short while ago, when Christmas was coming and grandfather came up to our house, I saw him with my three, three of my granddaughters. He was holding one who was asleep in his arms and the other two were draped over his shoulders. And that night as Jenny and I were going to bed, Grandfather had already gone to sleep, and Jenny said, just want to go in and kiss him once more, don't you? And you know, then I realized that same yearning that I had for my father, I now feel for Grandfather Minkai, the man who killed him. That's something that doesn't happen in, in fiction. That can only happen in true life. I saw th something that only God could do. I saw something that I couldn't predict. I don't think if I had a choice, I would allow to have happen. But God knew. You see, we, 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 from the outside, it says, we say, how could that happen? How can that be? But it was Steve saying it made sense. What God restores makes sense to the people that are in it. It works for the people who are in it. It's us that have the hard time with it. How can you love the man that killed your dad? I think if Steve Saint would be here, he would probably say, how could I not? How could I not? So we're good. Go ahead, brother. I just did not expect him to say that he thinks that uh, Minkai's forgiveness or risk yeah. was the greater one. Was the greater one. Was the greater one. Again, only God could give someone that kind of point of view, that lens to see clearly. Only God could do that. And God was working on something, and we see it over and over again in the Bible, and, and we see it in the life of Paul, who, who put the hit on Christians and hunted them down and put them in jail. And, and when Ananias was sent by God, and God told him, listen, I want you to pray for this brother, I want you to lay hands on him, and I want you to bring him into the fellowship. He's, Ananias said, listen, God, this guy has been doing terrible things to your people. He's infamous. And God said, listen, I've chosen him to be my vessel, and I'm going to show him how much he has to suffer for my name. What did God mean by that? He's like, I am going to have justice on Saul. But my justice is going to take a form that's a little bit different than what you might think. I'm going to make him into the greatest evangelist, Christian evangelist there has ever been. That's my form of justice. I'm going to restore him to the template, to the model, to the image that he's supposed to be. And what it means for us being a child of God causes us to need and want to trust God's brand of justice. What it means when, when God says, vengeance is mine, I will repay, we have to, that is a big leap of faith and trust. That means that it might not look the way you might want it to look. And we need to be okay with that. All right, restorative justice looks fantastic when it's people that we think deserve it. But are we completely committed to God being God, even over justice when it's done His way? God's not big on punishment. He's big on restoration. Yeah, we got to get consequences for our actions. And I'm not saying if someone breaks the law, there aren't consequences for that. I'm not big on cover-ups. I'm not big on turn in the other way when someone breaks the law. But what I am saying is that what God wants to do is restore. What God wants to do is to restore relationship, restore identity, restore connection. And he will do everything and anything in his power to do that. And if we're serious about being a follower of God, we've got to be cool with that too. Because the truth of the matter is, we're the recipient 
of restorative justice, each and every one of us. None of us gets what we deserve. All of us were in need of grace. All of us were in need of salvation, and we got it. So we're going to continue to talk about um, restorative justice in, in schools and in food and might talk about a whole bunch of things. We'll see what we'll talk about. But, but know that it all starts with me and you really being committed to restorative justice in our lives. Amen? Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that you are a God who restores. You are a God who redeems. You are a God who made us new. And Lord, help us to live really fully conscious of the grace that surrounds us, Lord God. And when others in our lives do things that we would not want them to do, that harm us, that harm those we care about, Lord God, help us to turn our eyes to you and look to you to solve the situation. It may not look like what we expect, but Lord, help us to embrace it nonetheless. It might not be what we want, but let us die to self and hold on to everything that you are. Lord, we thank you for how you are because now we have hope. We have a chance. We have more than a chance. The story's been written and we win. But as we continue to talk about restorative justice, help it to be personal for us and help us to seek for others what you've so freely given to us. We pray these things in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen.